We're back with another episode of the Inspiring Women in CX podcast, a series usually dedicated to real talk conversations between women in customer experience and technology. This series, we're putting some of our awesome allies in the hot seat too. No longer rehashing the same old conversations. In series seven, you can expect us to challenge the status quo on CX topics, provocative discourse, and naturally plenty of healthy debate. I'll be your host, Claire Musket, and in today's episode, I'll be talking to one seriously awesome woman from right here in the UK. As an early adopter of online customer experience, she spent the last 20 years working with digital brands, including ASOS and Spotify, building their customer service experience strategies and operations from scratch. The co-founder of Neo's Wave, an agency providing market-leading customer service solutions for digital brands, and a partner at the Fellowship of Responsible Business, let me introduce you to today's inspiring guest, Maria McCann. Hi, Maria. Hi, Claire. Yay, it's so great to have you here. Welcome to the Inspiring Women in CX podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here. Yes, and welcome to everybody who's listening or watching wherever you are. I'm super excited that you're coming on the podcast for the first time today as um, you joined the community a little while ago and we've been up to some exciting things together, haven't we? <laughs> um, well, the conference for a start, um, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it's been it's been really great uh, joining the Women in CX. I joined earlier this year and it's been, yeah, it's been really enriching uh, the, the whole experience and networking. I've loved it. Yeah, what, why did you decide to join in the first place? Like, what was your kind of motivation or, like, how did you find us? Like, how did that journey begin? Um, well, I had uh, posted something on LinkedIn. I quite I like to sort of use, like, memes and pictures and pop culture. And I think I posted something uh, paralleling customer service, comparing it to Love Island. <laughs> and one of your members uh one of your early members laura who uh, had um uh commented and then we decided to uh get a virtual coffee together you know sort of p- pick up these connections sometimes don't you mm. and she had said that she had joined this women in cx network and that she thought that i would find it really great um so i thought i'd take a look and then i joined and the rest is history as they say yeah. Oh, that's such a nice story. And can't get better than word of mouth, right? <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, so since you joined, like, do you want to share a little bit about the kinds of things you've been up to um since you've been a member? What's happened for you? <laughs> uh well, um so uh, other than meeting quite a few people virtually and then at the conference uh, sort of in person so definitely I would say my network has really expanded which is brilliant I've I've been looking at uh, you know I kind of get to look at the feed as well to get to see what really is going on in people's CX lives and also beyond which is great um, I um, have had work out of it which is fantastic um, uh, through you know, a connection that you had Claire so that's you know that that's been brilliant and I also did a this sort of TED style talk that you advocate so much for the first time um this year at your conference which was a big challenge for me I'm normally one that likes to keep behind the scenes um not really get involved in that sort of front of house um speaking so yeah so it was I, I decided to set myself this challenge and um yeah it was it was uh, I really enjoyed it really really enjoyed it and the conference itself was great as well yeah, you did an amazing job so I'm sure we'll come back to talk a little bit more about conference shortly but would you like to tell the listeners a little bit more about your career journey and how you ended up where you are today um well um I started out wanting to be an actor right? I didn't have oh. no no uh, no sort of real conscience of going into business or the corporate world at all um and I I got as a sort of 17 year old I got an audition at a really prestigious drama school in London and you have to kind of go through these like three stage audition and I got to the final stage and I thought this is it my my career is set I'm going to go to drama school I'm going to become a, a really great actor um and I 
hugely overcomplicated what I was going to do. How you have to do a Shakespearean monologue. And I decided to do Joan of Arc, but in an Irish accent. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, clearly experimenting at the time. And I completely overcomplicated it and absolutely blaked my audition. So I, I spent this sort of summer being really lost, didn't know what to do with myself. And my sort of dreams were in shatters. And I um, got a job at a, co a call centre, an outsourced call centre in London at the time that uh, was called Teledata. And we used to call it, all the agents used to call it Teletorture because we, we hated <laughs> it so much. Um, but actually, I was pretty good at it. I liked talking to customers. I liked leading people. I liked figuring out how to do more with the resources that I had around me. Um, and so I started off a career through that, through being an agent and then moving up through there. And then I got into um, the energy market as it was being deregulated in the late 90s. So that was a kind of really chaotic time for customers, for um, the companies that were setting up. Um, and uh, again, I sort of found my feet went through um you know went went through the sort of that process did the same with telecoms in the early noughties and then I sort of found myself in this online space um and I got an interview with a company called ASOS back in 2008 and or 2007 I think it was actually and I didn't even know who ASOS was at the time they were just sort of this sort of burgeoning you know behemoth um, but I didn't know that, the juggernaut that they were going to go on. And I got offered the role in, in my interview. And I was kind of like, oh, OK, I, I need to sort of this is this is moving at a bit of a pace here. And, you know, I was really fortunate to grow the customer care and the customer experience side of ASOS um, at a time where ASOS was really just breaking barriers in in retail all the time and I was able to do things like you know free returns the first UK retailer to do that first UK retailer to be on social media solving customer care problems things we take for granted now um looking at how to help customers self-serve better how to make you know returns kind of easier all that sort of stuff so I did that for a while and then I got headhunted by Spotify who were in a similar situation as ASOS when they started and they said would you come and do the same thing as you've done at ASOS but for a streaming service I'd like I think they just launched in the UK they weren't in the US yet they were kind of um you know we, we're going to grow we're going to be big and I was like oh, all right maybe you are maybe you are you know um but yeah and then did, did the same thing there and then I sort of thought I really, really like doing this stuff. I'd like to do it for more companies. And I had a uh, desire to work for myself. I think driven by the fact that I'd realized I was a pretty terrible employee generally. So uh, I had this sort of desire to work for myself and do this sort of work with other companies. And that's what I've been doing ever since. 10 years, wow. nearly, ten, nearly 10 years now. Yeah. What a great story. What a brilliant time to be involved with brands that went on to become household yeah. names and to yeah. have like been there setting the foundations for those that's super exciting so so what do you do now tell the listeners a little bit more about neo's wave <laughs> um well um neo's wave is sort of set up to be um a chop shop for anything and everything around the service experience for customers and by that i don't mean the calling a contact centre I mean how a brand serves its customers while they're having a relationship with them mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that's sort of everything really from strategy to data to um, uh, practical application of their um, a business's ambitions of how they want to serve their customers mm -hmm. um, and we do that in, in a few different ways. So we help clients with projects. 
um, and change that they want to make. We also take care of some of our clients' customers as well. Um, and But we do that in a way that isn't sort of outsourced. It's more of a way of what's your end goal. So if your end goal is to build a team, but you don't quite know how to do it yet, we'll help, we'll take care of it for you, we'll help you, but we'll also help you build that team. Um, right. And then, you know, then sort of, you know, help you get to where you need to be, help you navigate to where you need to be through the lens of, serving your customers so that's that's essentially what we're about what we do and would you say like your customers are more like startups or businesses that are implementing in-house customer service teams or is it um, like some, customer service team transformations or yeah it's a mixture so we we work with quite a lot of startups mm -hmm. um i really love small business i love mm -hmm. startup that startup culture um and you know during covid we actually did a we set up a free directory called still open for um small businesses to let people know that they were still open mm -hmm. and trading during covid um and so yeah i love small business so we do quite a lot of work with startups so we'll, we'll take care of their customers for them or we'll just help them kind of figure out how to do it themselves you know some of them might, might be doing serving their customers through whatsapp so mm. how do we help them do that we do that in the uk and also in other countries as well so um italy mexico for example is a really great um place that has a really mm. good startup culture uh mm. and and kind of low barriers to wanting to get stuff done as well and then we have what i would describe sort of heritage companies as well so we um we work in sort of luxury fashion kind of you know clients that are over 100 years old who are really let's say slower to change have the desire but lots of legacy lots of, other, lots of legacy lots of things get in the way um lots of rituals that they they don't want to let go of um so that's much more of a sort of longer term relationship and a slower sort of process to getting them where they need to be mm -hmm. And now for a quick word from one of our sponsors. We are proud to be supported by Kantar, the world's leading evidence-based insight and consulting company. Kantar CX helps clients define customer and employee experience strategies, better understand their customers via measurement, and in turn, improve business outcomes, driving true commercial ROI. To find out more about Kantar CX practice, please visit the sponsor links on the homepage of womenincx.community. Now back to the episode. And I'm... Um, have you experienced any like barriers or challenges on your way to becoming the woman you are today? Oh gosh, barriers or challenges. I wouldn't, uh, only probably in my own mind. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, um, you know, in terms of actually the career that I've had, I suppose if you want to call it a career, I don't think necessarily being a woman has held me back. Mm -hmm. but maybe my perceptions of how I should handle myself as a woman in certain situations, meetings, um, you know, that sort of thing has, you know, will, will have definitely probably affected me and, and held me back. Uh, I try not to let, I think as I get older, I understand that more. I think when maybe you don't at the start of your career understand how, you know, if you're in a meeting with, a bunch of guys which I am frequently um it's a difficult balance to get your voice heard sometimes without coming across as um the bossy the bossy woman or um or the you know the sort of meek and mild it's a it can be a tough balance yeah. not so much nowadays but I think yeah when I started out definitely it was probably there uh, I was talking to actually Ian Golding on a previous podcast mm. Mm. about um, the experience women have of other people's expectations of who we're supposed to be, particularly mm. in the workplace. So mm. like needing to be like super likable as um, mm. as people where men aren't expected to be that or how differently our behavior could get interpreted. So like you said, you know, being seen as bossy actually mm. like the same behavior would be being seen as assertive for a man because of this yeah, expectation totally. of how we're supposed to be 
Um, and yeah, I, I really feel you, particularly earlier in, earlier in my career, really feeling the need to be liked in order to succeed at the expense mm -hmm. of sometimes mm -hmm. maybe sharing what I really thought. Um, and the frustration of saying something in a meeting that 10 minutes later, a guy would say, and what I'd said had kind of been glossed over, especially when I was you know, just a younger woman, someone would say exactly the same thing. And they were a guy who was older and everyone would be like, that's it. <laughs> and really getting bored with what they're saying, even though we'd said exactly the same thing. Yeah. So... Or, or being, being sort of taking on, <laughs> and I still do it now, taking on the responsibility of sort of being like the peacekeeper. So the one that sort of brings together, okay, you know, there's, where there's different um, opinions around the table, taking on the role of trying to find a way forward rather than actually um, being one of the opinionators. Mm. Um, that, that's something I've definitely done. And, and that's my responsibility as well. You know, even at, at your conference, Claire, um, uh, John, who was like so brilliant, and he went, I was aware that he he went over his time. John Sills, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hugely. Um, and then I, I assumed it was my job, my responsibility to then bring back that time. And I think that's quite a female thing to do is to sort of mm -hmm. that motherly kind of thing to do to sort of go oh well they've gone over their time I must sort of look after the herd and mm -hmm. um make sure that we kind of claw that claw that back that sort of yeah that kind of um peace bringer or solution bringer I think it works against us sometimes as women mm, yeah because it's like an amazing skill to be the facilitator but it's a bit unfair that in the absence of anybody else taking on that role that yeah as women we assume it and assume that responsibility yeah. um because we Sometimes, want collaboration yeah. to happen um and that's a great yeah. thing about female leadership um but again it's that kind of question around at the expense of what yeah you know. sometimes it's okay to get involved in the fight mm. yeah. and put on your boxing gloves yeah <laughs> <laughs> i agree so um so it's let's carry on talking about conference then like how what did you what are your reflections on October the 10th 2023 <laughs> just I think overall um just the sort of the energy was so warm and thoughtful and everybody I could really feel everybody was learning in a really um yeah in a really warm and thoughtful manner actually and um, what I also really enjoyed was that people who I'd never met before, but maybe I'd read a post or a feed, part of their feed, you felt like you sort of knew them a little bit, um, mm. which, so it was, it was very, in, in that sense, it was those sort of introductions and I mean, I, I hate conferences uh, <laughs> generally, I really do, I can't, I'm, I'm always the one in the corner with the coffee not wanting to talk to anybody you know but um I didn't feel that way at this conference because I felt like I knew people there even though I didn't know them I felt like mm. I knew them um because we were all we all had something in common to start with which was women in CX mm. um that's, that's really good to know yeah and it did we feel had common ground yeah um, then that's definitely the strongest thing that comes out of the feedback is the sense of safe space and psychological safety in mm. a space that is a women in CX space, whether that's online or in person, that you mm. are safe to show up exactly how you are, be yourself. Um, and that warmth and kindness kind of radiates from everybody because we share the same values, right? Um, as part of this organization. Yeah. So yeah, no, I think that's really important. Um, does that mean you're a bit of an introvert then? If you're the person sat drinking coffee alone most of the time <laughs> at conferences, um, I think I'm just a bit, um, uh, maybe a bit introverted. Um, I think uh, the last time I did it, I was a, a what they call an ambivert, which oh, yeah. is sort of right in the middle. So sometimes it's it's you know it's great. I love like hosting. Mm. Um, 
you know, I like being with people, but then I also really like that sort of alone time. I think I don't, I think I'm uncomfortable in a space that maybe I don't have control, any control uh. over. Um, <laughs> yeah yeah I think that's... that maybe that's more what it is and I get a bit grumpy so uh so I kind of stand in the corner until someone comes and talks to me that's interesting um because <laughs> I know that I love it I absolutely mm. love being around people but I don't know if it's as I've got older but I realize just how much it takes out of me being so present like um the exhaustion um that I feel sometimes it's like depletion from like social experiences and I don't think I used to be like that maybe I'm just getting old um but when I look at the like tests that you do I actually have like a lot of introverted characteristics mm. <laughs> but I I don't know if it's to do with having ADHD and like learning to mask a lot of my behaviors that mm. that's how it's enabled me to do what I do and like be a speaker um, even though I'm absolutely petrified before any time I stand on stage I'm like literally my legs go to jelly um, mm, but once mm. I start speaking then I You're feel fine. like I'm in so, some kind of like yogic flow the time goes so quickly and I can't think about anything else I'm just literally there like in my element what was it like for you so you said it was a challenge to mm. do the talk like what was mm. what was challenging about it like why you know for you why did you set this at yourself this challenge to do it so I think there was two main things that were challenging for me the first was getting up and and speaking um I'm much better with a script than sort of just getting up and talking it's never been something I've been terribly comfortable with um but I want I wanted to yeah I wanted to test myself in that in that sense and I think the second challenge was the format when I have the hardest one to do (laughs) yeah when I have got up to speak before it's been a case of either some sort of case study or sharing lessons that 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 sort of informative slide you know deck guiding through uh presentation format Mm. and that's quite an easy crutch then to rely on Mm. if you've got some slides behind you even if they're entertaining slides you've got that flow to help guide you through it whereas this was um not about as you pointed out to me a few times not about explaining yourself it was about here's the message Mm. and here's why you need to consider it and how do you get somebody through some picture or story some parallel examples to understand what the message is that you're trying to say yeah it's more like conveying an idea isn't it and conveying an idea without but you're not you're not you can't be too conceptual about it either Mm. um I thought I thought you did you did absolutely brilliantly I thought it was absolutely bang on thank Um, you never would have known it was your first time doing that format at all (laughs) no Um, so they they were the yeah I was glad I did I was really glad I did it um sorry to interrupt your listening but I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit more about Wix we're the world's first online membership community for women in customer experience Our mission is clear, and that's to unleash the power of women to lead the future of human-centered business. Working in CX can feel lonely at times, we're often single-handedly trying to change the way organizations think and behave about customers. On our paid platform, you can discover a vibrant tribe of fellow female professionals, find support from knowledgeable peers, learn best practices from experts and practitioners, and be inspired to up your game through leading edge CX and EX thinking. If you feel like you aren't making enough progress with your CX objectives, are unsure about what your next move looks like, or are struggling to achieve your career ambitions, you're not alone. To learn more about membership, see how women are progressing personally and professionally with the support of the number one community in CX, you can apply to join us today by visiting www.womenincx.community forward slash membership. I really hope I get to see you there soon. Yeah. Any, Any tips for aspiring speakers out there? 
uh, keep it like for the TED style talk start with the end in mind what is it that you want the listener to go away with so I had so many people after just got to me and go how's the weather Maria because that was <laughs> kind of pivotal part yeah. of that talk was about the um the idea that the sort of what was meant to be a set of kind of in, I don't really like the word empowering but what was what was meant to be a sort of empowering exercise for a business turned into a nightmare because the same question kept being asked and it just got into a routine and the process um rather than actually serving that customer properly you probably have to tell the audience what the how's the weather story like oh, <laughs> um, they, won't, they won't know because maybe people weren't there because they, they won't know so <laughs> um so the the idea behind the message was around a company that I did some work with who um decided that they needed to improve the quality in their contact center. This was through feedback from their NPS uh, surveys. And because their agents weren't considered to be friendly enough. Mm -hmm. And so what they decided to do was put a, put a quality marking that was about the agents asking an open question to that customer. So if the agents asked an open question to that customer, they'd get a tick in this quality score. And that would improve their NPS. This was the leaps in logic that this company made. And so what the agents did, because they were still under all the other constraints of average handling time and, you know, dealing with several customers per day, was they started to sort of game the system organically by asking the same question, which was the simplest question to ask in a call, which was, how's the weather? And nobody really noticed this the scores didn't really go up but nobody really noticed mm. this until uh, an elderly lady phoned up to explain that her husband had died and she needed to sort of settle the affairs of this particular company and the agent ignored that and went straight into asking how's the weather and once that call was listened to the kind of um you know the sort of uh the kind of emperor's clothes kind of fell mm -hmm. down and mm -hmm. every, they realized actually what a sort of disaster this initiative had been mm -hmm. no it's such a powerful example isn't it because i remember like everyone in the audience when you when you shared that story everybody like co coiled didn't they like oh yeah like face plant you just kind know of, like, you just, just you know, know what's yeah. coming yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah you know what's coming um but a great way to describe actually the reality of CX today I think in that mm. Mm. the motivation has become so about um, measurement mm. NPS mm. Um, outcomes that mm. people are gaming the system because that's what they're being measured against so rather than you know genuinely empowered empathetic kind compassionate service which is what those results really said people wanted it became a well here's a really easy solution for us to tick that box and get a score and therefore yeah. why it didn't actually really change anything so it's like disingenuous but it's understandable why in this present day that's so obsessed with metrics surveys uh, yeah. audits um, outcomes rather than or yeah like more focus I think is on measuring outcomes than on understanding customers yeah. and delivering action and genuine change that would make those outcomes a million times better it's just how do we make that leap as you said from connecting this dot over here about a lower score to increasing that score yeah. which is a great service so um any more thoughts from you on like this the state of service today or cx well i mean i just i sort of so when like as i said to you when i started out we were in and you would have been probably a similar time we we were in what i would describe as a sort of bootstrap phase of yeah. cx so nothing really existed did it it was it wasn't existed. even a thing we were doing a lot of the right. things that would be commoditized as a cx practice today but it wasn't known as exactly that word exactly so we were 
you know, the, the goal was how do you, how do we support this business to, to grow, right? Mm. Through um, better engagement, better service, better experience for customers. Um, and everything was really built around that and using the resources around us to try and achieve that goal. And then, uh, and then I sort of look today and I think, well, you know, we've got so much more insight and data available to us. The barriers to technology are much lower than they were 10 years ago. The cost of getting stuff done, the cost of talent, you know, um, uh, ability to sort of manage a project should be much slicker than it is than it was 10 years ago and yet we still don't seem to be making the progress we don't seem to be have made the progress that we should have done um so you know transformation failure rates haven't really changed no, they're still, still 75%. stuck yeah <laughs> still stuck where they were cost to serve isn't really coming down as it should do to allow businesses to then invest in the things that they want to to support growth and, and loyalty with customers mps isn't really isn't really moving um but that I mean that might be a sort of a probably a whole separate conversation about why that probably is um so customer satisfaction in the uk has gone down from where yeah. it was uh, or the indicators are saying it's worse than well, pre-pandemic so, isn't it so if it's if it, if there's less barriers today than there were 10 years ago why why aren't we making the inroads that we that we should be and i my conclusion is that we are at the moment on this production line of industrial measurements frameworks programs and it's we're all kind of doing similar things and then in our companies working out how to make them work um, and trying to rather than thinking what what is the goal here to grow customers or have more loyal customers it's how do we bring in this measurement so that we show how good we are and how do we then try and bend bend it somehow to our will? MPS is a classic example of that. You know, there's so many companies that I speak to that sort of say to me, it's one at the moment actually that that is that I'm working with that's asked me, or they wanted to increase their MPS score by not sending out any surveys <laughs> until. Oh. <laughs> until um until they they were absolutely sure that the they fixed it yeah. they fixed the problems yeah 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 and that, that obsession with scores isn't it it's the obsession with scores it's sort of like well the amount of effort you're putting into not doing that <laughs> or working out a way to not do not do the thing that you'll want to do versus actually just figuring out how do I fix these problems in my business better mm -hmm. faster for customers um so yeah so that's sort of my conclusion my question really is why aren't we making more inroads if there's so much more available to us to be to be able to do so um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always use the example from my retail days, though, like to, to suggest it isn't necessarily a specific measure, even though I have so many problems with NPS. In retail, they used to use what's called mystery shopper audits, yeah. and that was yeah. on the scorecard yeah. for all the stores, and therefore yeah. um, the, so the key service metric. So the stores would spend more time trying to game spotting the mystery shopper Absolutely. than they would in yeah. actually improving yeah. store standards. And yeah. They'd like have like phone trees where the mystery shopper was on the patch. Everyone beware. Like they, this whole email chain came out. Like <laughs> they'd like gone around stores. And some of the examples that like I heard when we did actual like employee based research of um, 
like this misinterpretation of what CX and service was, was to be mystery shopper, not to be delivering great service to customers. And I think to some extent, NPS has become customer experience to businesses. Um, and, they're, and they're trying to improve that, not customer experience to generate better outcomes, but just focusing on how do we move the move a needle and it it blow it blows my mind it really does um but i can't think um so if, but i think like the amount of bad digital we've now got as well so you know 75 percent of transformations were failing five years ago they're still failing now but particularly within the contact center industry like the rise of the the value of companies that are tech vendors for customer experience not saying anything against them directly but um, the solution to other operational problems about reducing things like cost to serve by deflecting customers mm. into bad digital. Like mm. Mm. it's not a case that people mm. don't want to use digital or over time digital will not become the norm, mm. but providing bad digital <laughs> customer service is part of that problem. So, um, so for me, I think the thing that needs to change there is how do we use technology to solve problems for customers and even simple things like knowledge bases and queries if you're going to use something like chat making sure that that is really really strong but it's not Mm. it's like turned on with very limited learning and I I know as a consumer that's the benefit of being in customer experience isn't it because we're all consumers ourselves like we're still having those even with generative AI conversations where chatbots can't solve anything because they've not been given the t- problems people are really looking to solve and been trained on solving those problems or the knowledge base being built to um, give people those answers. Um, Co- where completely, do you... yeah, sorry, completely go correct. Go on, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, where, where do you think we're, we're heading from here? Like, what do you think is coming like, next for customer um, experience? I mean, I don't think, I think the obsession with, AI and MPS and voice of customer is not going to dissipate anytime soon. So um, I think we can expect a lot more of that. From my side, I was just going to take the point about AI and learning Mm. is that, um, you know, so within my company, we're working more with small language models rather than large language Mm. models, better for the environment. Um, better for the customer, um, better for the business as well, um, in many cases. And where we look after companies, customers, we actually integrate the agent with the AI. So mm-hmm. it's the it's the part of the part of the front line's job to work with the AI mm-hmm. to make sure that it can provide answers where where it's needed and mm-hmm. and um that is starting i think to work quite well for us um so where do i think it was that the question where do i think it's going yeah where do you think where do you think yeah and and, and, and yeah. then the, the, the last question i was going to ask you is like where do you think we need to be focusing on today so feel free to okay. answer both of those in one <laughs> okay so i think um I think where I think it's going is going to be better, definitely more technology, more AI, Mm -hmm. right? So, and I think in some ways that's a good thing. You know, customers shouldn't be waiting on, you know, waiting to speak to. I mean, I I had a technical problem with a website. It just kept bringing up errors, and I had to wait two days for a response Mm -hmm. for it to be a response of. How we checked your cookies. So I thought I could get that in thirty, you know, in yeah. in under two seconds. Yeah. If if that's all you've got to offer me, mm-hmm. um, I, I can get that from an automated, you know, yeah. response. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily help me, but at least I don't have to wait two days for it. Yeah. Um. So I think more automation, more AI, more obsession with some of this sort of industry sized, um, production line tech and frameworks i don't think that's going anywhere what i hope is that my hope is that people will start to use it for to actually think about the problems that they're solving Mm -hmm. and maybe um 
things like more open source technology will allow us to plug, will allow us in companies to kind of plug and play more and interconnect more technologies or more ways of doing things that meets our own personal goals rather than having to adopt something wholesale. So that's sort of where I would hope we get to. Um, where I think we are today, the other thing that I think we are, that, 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 that I think will start to come out is this more need for more human interaction. Um, uh, I'm definitely seeing that more a swing back away, away from how do we deflect this to actually engagement with the customer can be really powerful and good and valuable for both parties. So how do we, how do we just allow um, people who are talking with customers and serving customers to engage with them in a really healthy, organic way that, you know, helps both the business and, and the customer get what they want out of the relationship. So I think that there's definitely going to be some human, human connection there. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think, and I think the, insights will start to move away from that sort of structured um reporting that almost has a lot of kind of confirmation bias attached to it because you're you're sort of reporting on the things that you expect the results mm -hmm. from um mm -hmm. into actually looking at more unstructured um uh information and being able to pull out themes and nuggets from that to be able to do things with but unfortunately until businesses figure out how to take customer how to take what customers are doing with their business and how customers want to transact with them um as a backdrop of their of customers lives and how they figure out how to solve problems and barriers to doing that in a way that is more of a team-based approach rather than through silos or through bringing in a big consultant to do it for you, none of this is going to matter. So, so where do you... <laughs> that's yes. really kind of, <laughs> that's really so, sort of maudlin uh, approach to it, but that's uh, that's sort of where I'm at, I think. Yeah. So let's think, let's think about like our listeners then. Like, What would be your... Um, advice for them to be focusing on in the here and now and trying to bring about that change um what would yes. you say they should be doing next so i think um i think if there's a way within within their own company of um so i, I think that one of the most powerful ways to bring teams together is through experimentation Mm -hmm. um, and through sort of simulation of of experiences mm -hmm. that that they would have for customers. Um, so very simply, getting into the customer's shoes. So that can be done through simulation. It can be done through testing and learning things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if there was one thing that I think could bring different teams different departments together into a single cause it would be having the space and time to come together to agree on something that they wanted to do and then experiment on it together mm. and go through that learning together because that yields insight yields team building it yields understanding it yields a product potentially or a service out of it yeah um, i'm a massive fan of um basically doing desk research to understand complaint history like yeah. actual um stories from customers and amalgamating them together to create like a yeah. basically a user story and a persona yeah. and then getting teams from across functions to map that so they can actually connect with the reality of what's happening and to look to what were the root causes of this and most of the time it's process isn't it <laughs> so 
it, or ways of working that are it's fixable. ways of working yeah it's mm-hmm. it's the rituals that a company builds over time mm-hmm. to that, that rituals they and silos <laughs> yeah that they then just sort of forget about um yeah. and you know the the other thing I would say to that is you know how it's, it's really worth looking at how much effort goes into managing failure in your business mm-hmm. um so taking like you say an amalgamation of feedback stories complaints mm-hmm. against a particular scenario that customers you know retail might be failed delivery or um you know product might be not great mm-hmm. um and then track that back to seeing how much effort goes into supporting that failed process or that failed product Mm. just because that's the way it's always been done Mm. and then if you can apply a cost to that you could then say all right let's use that money let's stand up that same money to test something else Mm. love that love that so that's all we've got time for today unfortunately but if there was like one piece of advice or takeaway from our conversation today you'd like to leave listeners with what would that be um if you're bringing in a framework or a piece of technology just really consider if i if i didn't have this if i didn't have mps for a month what impact would that have on my business apart from like bonuses that some companies <laughs> do what what impact would that have on my business what impact would that have on my customers yeah if you're if, if you if you're running something at the moment mm-hmm. you stopped it tomorrow what impact would it have yeah on I think your that, customers what, and on your business yeah I think that what impact would it have on your customers is a really important yeah. one isn't it yeah yeah Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here, being part of Women in CX. And I can't wait for you to come and do a webinar that expands on that 15 minute version on why okay. frameworks might be killing your innovation in the community soon. Um, right. So, so yeah, great to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to everybody who's listening or watching wherever you are. We'll see you all next time. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Inspiring Women in CX podcast with me, Claire Muscat. If you enjoyed the episode and you don't already, please, please, please do drop us a like and subscribe to our channel. The bigger the following, the bigger the impact we can create on our mission to amplify the voices of women working in CX and technology. Well, that's all for now. Join us again next time where I'll be talking to another inspiring woman in CX this time from Finland about the rise of the machine customer and how they're set to revolutionize CX. See you all soon.